This is Carrie Kim. Listeners, prick up your ears as we have an essential show for you today. Kelly Ryerson of Glyphosate Facts joins us to share presence, legacy, and stewardship of this area. Our show comes to you from the homelands of the Tongva and all of their relatives, and we invite you to align with and actively support local First Nations wherever you live. Herbicides, glyphosate, one of the most common ingredients in herbicides and the main ingredient in Monsanto's infamous weed killer, Roundup. Roundup is one of the world's most widely used herbicides. Monsanto is now owned by pharma giant Bayer, as most of you may know. In 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified glyphosate as probably carcinogenic in humans and confirmed to cause cancer in lab animals. However, the EPA continues to maintain that glyphosate is safe for human use, despite multiple studies demonstrating otherwise. Roundup and glyphosate-based products have had devastating impacts on our food systems, agriculture, public health, and ecosystem in the broadest sense. Introduced as part of the 70s Green Revolution, Roundup was touted as a product that would help address poverty by increasing crop yields and agricultural production. Glyphosate radically altered the face of farming, farming on this continent. Small family, farmers, small family farms, once the norm, were quickly overshadowed by the industrial farms of big ag and big chem. Herbicides, GMOs, monocropping, and soil degradation became the standard over biodiversity and soil health to which we attribute current astounding rates of chronic and degenerative diseases. Cancer, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, digestive, digestive disorders, diabetes, obesity, autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, allergies, kidney, liver, and autoimmune diseases are often correlated with widespread use of glyphosate, as well as reproductive issues, infertility, and sperm count declines. While glyphosate continues to be a planetary health emergency, we as a collective can catalyze change by making informed consumer choices and advocating against chemical products and farming practices that cause irreparable harm. Plaintiffs have begun to win in court to address harms they suffered from Roundup. However, it will take many more of us to fully eradicate not only glyphosate, but all toxic chemicals for planetary health. Kelly Ryerson is here to show us how we just might arrive there sooner. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here to talk about this. Thanks for your irrepressible commitment and conviction to eliminate glyphosate from our environment in our lifetimes. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> that, is, that is my goal. <laughs> <laughs> you sent us a picture which says, Roundup gave me leaky gut. Can you tell us about your own health journey related to Roundup? I'm sure I'm, I'm assuming there is a story there. Yes, there, there certainly is. Usually people don't wear t-shirts round that say Roundup, keep you leaky gut. Although people have asked to buy that t-shirt, so maybe I should be printing them. <laughs> so I, like many, many Americans and actually people globally, um, I started feeling just really off and and really sick in different body systems. And it was just really hard to assess what was going on with me. But just to give you an idea of some of the symptoms, it started really with fatigue, just being really too tired and not excited to get up and do things anymore. And I had had a baby like a few years years earlier. And so you can kind of attribute that to, oh, well, maybe it's being a, a mom mm -hmm. with a young child or, or whatever. Um, and, but it became sort of more than that where, I was having really strange tingling in my hands. I was getting headaches. I, my vision wasn't great. I had rashes on my body mm -hmm. and my digestion was just off. I couldn't keep on weight. Just these things were starting to accumulate that definitely were scary, frankly. And, and I saw my primary care doctor who was Stanford and Harvard trained. And mm -hmm. so I had utmost trust in this position because of her education mm -hmm. And she completely failed me and said, um, with each visit I'd make with a new symptom. And she thought that I was a hypochondriac and that I, because the lab tests weren't showing anything wrong with me. And I was like, right. but I know I'm having these symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I hear so many of my friends now talking about this kind of thing. And I, so I knew something was up and 
but having your doctor tell you, no, nothing's wrong with you. You are imagining it right. can actually make you kind of go crazy. And, mm-hmm. and she said, I think that you're depressed and you're anxious and you have a young child. And, mm-hmm. and so after going to about 20 specialists and no one being able to tell me otherwise, I finally went to go see a psychiatrist because I thought maybe I'm nuts. I mean, at that point, anything <laughs> to get relief and I went to see the psychiatrist who happened to have intake blood work mm-hmm. on uh, me and I, he happened to have vitamin panel on it. And it's not something that even crossed my mind. No doctor tested for it. And it came back and I was so deficient in all these key vitamins and minerals. Wow. Just entirely deficient and like shockingly third world level deficiency. And it didn't really make sense because I had access to food and so I, um, I was really floored and took that information and a new doctor told me, I think you should try going gluten-free. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, well, that's strange. I think that I thought that was just sort of like, frankly, a Hollywood trend, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and, and annoying maybe, mm-hmm. or like hippie and I don't know, just <laughs> annoying. Right. And so, but I thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'll try anything at this point just to feel better. And I went gluten-free and I started feeling better. And I started like supplementing back the vitamins and I'm like, what the heck, what is it about gluten that's doing this? Uh So that opened up a whole new world. And I I went to a conference, um, a big celiac and gluten sensitivity conference in New York. And some scientists were saying, we don't know what's behind this epidemic of gluten sensitivity, but we don't think it's actually the gluten because if you sterilize gluten and you give it to someone who's gluten sensitive, they don't have an inflammatory response. So there must be something else going on. And that was the key moment that I said, well, what else is on this wheat? And it turns out that glyphosate, which is once again, the active ingredient in the weed killer roundup is sprayed over all of our non-organic grains in harvest. Mm -hmm. And so we're all eating this chemical and all of us are consuming grains probably more than anything else. And I, it's just led to this huge epidemic of chronic disease. So I'm happy to say that I'm healthy now, but it was a long road and it is a long road to figure out what it is it's causing it when Western medicine is telling you, you know, you're crazy. Right, exactly. Well, is that what compelled you to launch Glyphosate Facts? Like how long afterward did you really become an advocate for, um, you know, removing glyphosate? So at the, it was interesting at the time, this was happening. It so happened that the there are a bunch of maybe you've heard of them, but there have been a lot of trials for cancer trials around this chemical, and it's been very clearly shown in published research that this can cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So exposure to Roundup can cause it, specifically glyphosate, the active ingredient, and so I went up because I live in San Francisco. That's where the trials were, mm-hmm. and so I went up because I just wanted to see if there were going to be protests because Monsanto, the owner at the time of, of Roundup Mm -hmm. is a notorious company that just people have hated forever because they just (laughs) are the devil. (laughs) They get a company (laughs) for making poisons and it's just crazy. So I went to San Francisco, which by the way, is historically a very passionate place with all kinds of protests. And there was not a single person that was there. Mm-hmm. And I was so shocked. And so I walked right into the courthouse. I sat right down with the lawyers and said, hey, I, I'm here because I wanted to hear about the trial. Uh-huh. And no one was there covering it on a day-to-day basis. And so I said, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to blog each day of this trial mm-hmm. because there are a lot of secrets about Monsanto that are coming out. And so I first founded the blog uh, Glyphosate Girl and mm-hmm. then moved it over to be um, Glyphosate Facts where I could really have a spot for people to come and learn about what this chemical is because- industry hides it like crazy. And, and if you criticize what industry is doing, so in this case, Bayer, because Bayer bought Monsanto um, in 2018, mm-hmm. then they will go after you like trolls and say you're crazy. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky road. Yeah. The information is instantly suppressed. You know, could you, could you explain, I know it's kind of like going to the beginning, but for people who because we've said a lot of people don't even know that there's any harm in Roundup and they have it sitting in their garage. So could you explain the relationship of Roundup and Roundup Ready GMOs? It's really very kind of elementary stuff, but it's important for people who don't know much about glyphosate already. Yes. 
And it, it's such a good question to ask because I was very confused when I started this. I didn't realize how very connected GMOs are to Roundup and, or I frankly didn't know anything about anything with agriculture or what I was eating. Um, so it's very interesting. So glyphosate in the so Monsanto launched Roundup, which with glyphosate in it in 1976. Mm -hmm. And they then put it on the market and it was mildly successful and, and still second to a few other, or second to a different herbicide, but People liked it and people were buying it and using it residentially and farmers were using it. But of course, they're using it to spray to kill a weed on a farm that they have to be really careful around their crops because if you spray it on the crop, the, the crop dies. Right. So their patent on Monsanto's patent on glyphosate was set to expire and it was one of their blockbuster products. And so they knew that they needed to change something to in order to keep on making profit. So that is when they started to develop these genetically modified seeds. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is the future because we're going to be able to create this food using genetically modified seeds and they're going to have better yields and they're just going to make the farmer's life easier. And, you know, all this amazing accolade towards what they call, um, they, they say it's biotechnology and, you know, it, I guess it, it is biotechnology, but so now when you see biotechnology as it as it um, relates to agriculture, usually they're talking about um, GMOs. So they launched uh, the, a new seed in, in 1996. They said, okay, so we need to be sure we keep on selling Roundup. So we're going to launch this. We are going to genetically modify a seed so that when a farmer plants it, it can grow and you can just spray Roundup on top of the crop and it won't die because it's been bred to be resistant to the effects of it, of glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So they did this with corn and soy and cotton. And, and those are the three biggies in terms of genetically modified seeds that are round. They're called Roundup Ready mm -hmm. seeds because <laughs> they are ready to be sprayed and, and yeah. they won't die. Yeah. So, so then, so, so then that explodes. So they launched that GMOs took off like wildfire in the United States became mm -hmm. quickly became the dominant form of corn and soy that we have here in cotton that we mm -hmm. have in this country. And just that you see the use of glyphosate explode in parallel with it. And that was 1996, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That we saw the first GMO crops, the Roundup yeah. Ready crops come out. Exactly. And it's interesting because I traced back to when I started having just some kind of everyday digestive problems and it was in 1996. Mm -hmm. and, okay, but maybe that's what that was. That was the launch. Well, it's amazing to think that this has been, uh, that glyphosate has been around for really five decades now. And then, but also like you said, to talk about the explosion of it when the Roundup Ready crops uh, seeds were developed. So, you yeah. know, and I think we've already had like this first wave of GMOs. And now we know we're kind of getting ready to see like, I think a second wave of people have already been talking about that. But um, I wanted to, to ask you if you could also share how Roundup or glyphosate is used in agriculture as a desiccant and explain what a desiccant is. And then that kind of traces back to all the conversation you had about grain products. But yeah, absolutely. Around actually the same time um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the farmers realized, oh, this also is extremely effective at drying out a crop all at once. So what when someone is farming grains, it is hard at harvest time because on a typical field, the grain will mature at different rates from one side of the field to the other. So when you are all set and you're going out and you want to be um, harvesting, mm -hmm. it's much easier to have everything just ready to go. And you do one fell swoop, and cut all your grain and you're just done. Right. So, but that actually throughout history hasn't been the way that it's done because that wasn't possible unless you could kill off all of it and dry it all out at one time. Mm -hmm. So that is where Roundup came in and farmers realized, okay, we can take our sprayer out there, spray it all so that it dies. And then we'll go in with our combine and, and farm it or and harvest it. And that, and so they harvest it, it's put in the combine, it's processed then at the mill, and then it's directly put out into food producers, factories. So mm -hmm. the step between being sprayed with Roundup to our bread or these other grain containing um, foods is really quick and 
it's mm -hmm. estimated that over 80% of our dietary exposure to Roundup is actually through this process of pre-harvest spray. So the, the GMOs are there, are there are one component, but mm -hmm. probably our dietary exposure is much more through this process of spraying the grains. No, in I terms understand. of GMOs, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the GMOs, uh, interestingly, most of it goes to animal feed, which is something I didn't realize at first. So a big chunk of it goes straight to animal feed. And that is why you'll see so many very sickly animals. And you have another component that's going in when you're at the gas pump and you see 10% ethanol that mm -hmm. comes from genetically modified corn. Right. And so it's processed into that. We export tons of it to Mexico and to China and for their animal feed. And then this smaller portion, like 9% or something like that goes into food stuff. So that's where the high fructose corn syrup comes from. They take the GMO corn and they process it to a pulp and and send that on its way to be our sweeteners so it's not yeah. great and that's why people who are, are also um uh carnivores or omnivores need to really remember what their animals are eating in those gm crops or in the roundup sprayed crops you know oh, absolutely in all the different uh, places it's like six degrees of roundup you know it, it, it totally is and it's so sad. I had the opportunity to, I went and watched a uh, GMO corn harvest one time with a very nice farmer and he had a neighboring uh, capo. So uh, like an animal factory with cows that are very sad and packed in. And so it was, it was harvested and then we drove over there and I just looked around at these cows that were just so incredibly sick, just the mucus running out of their noses and just lifeless they're eating that poison so it's just really heartbreaking it's not the way we should be processing our meat at all or growing our meat terrible definitely not well i also understood or read that even those um foods that are organic can have this pre-harvest spraying and that's why i think people who just think oh i'm just buying organic and everything is fine there's the drift and then there's also the pre-harvest spraying right i don't know if you want so to the oh, yeah yeah, so drift is certainly a problem. So certainly some grains that you find uh, that are organic, if you went and brought them to the lab, you might find that there's some glyphosate on it. But in terms of actually being sprayed with this process, that shouldn't be allowed in organic. Right. Now, do people sometimes lie? Maybe, <laughs> you know, it's, unless it, the USDA knows, typically right. sends an evaluator out there to assess is that really what's happening and actually the mills now because there's a little bit more awareness some of the mills aren't wanting to take grains with glyphosate on it they um, are and so they are not wanting it That's and good. which is great news because it comes from them to put the pressure on the farmers and so they'll keep little sacks of each delivery of, mm -hmm. of wheat and so they can go back and test it and see did you actually spray mm -hmm. it were you lying Oh. Now, this is not all mills. This is just a few, but I like the way that's going. Is that for their own exposure, that they're protecting their own health or the health of their families, people on their farms? Their I farms? think it's straight up because people like Kellogg's and General Mills are wanting them to not be having glyphosate grains or else they're going to buy from a different mill. So mm -hmm. I think it's only an economic decision, but it's a good one. Okay. And that then that ultimately comes from the pressure from the consumer. So sure. it's actually a totally we know it's the bottom up movement. But Kelly, we're going to take a quick break right here and we'll come back and talk a little bit about Roundup as a mineral chelator. So, Kelly, we were just talking about Roundup and the dietary exposure to glyphosate. And now I wonder if you could speak a bit more about Roundup as a mineral chelator and what that means for our soil and nutrient density. Absolutely. When glyphosate was introduced, what, glyphosate was first discovered in the 1950s. And it was a chemist that was looking for different applications for pharmaceuticals. And glyphosate was discovered, they couldn't find any type of pharmaceutical application for it. And so then, but then someone else figured out, oh, wow, this is really an effective chemical that could be used to bind up different minerals. And so we could clean pipes with this. We could put it into boilers, <laughs> into metal pipes. Right. And, and put it in there and it'll collect all these minerals and then you, you can clean it out really easily. <laughs> it was so effective. Mm -hmm. That is definitely a key property and characteristic of this chemical is that it's excellent at binding to key minerals. And 
So now what we have is the fact that our soil has been so drenched in this, whether it's GMOs or desiccation, but all across this country is just been completely drenched in glyphosate. And so when glyphosate is in the soil, it has that same property. So it will bind to these minerals like zinc and magnesium um, and, and copper, all these things that our body really depends on, it will bind mm -hmm. to it and not allow it to be available for the crop to take up. So typically mm -hmm. in farming, in, in food, the plant will derive all the nutrients from the soil. Right. But if they are not available in the soil, then the crop's not going to have them. And so we may be eating something that looks like, say, a strawberry or looks like a really beautiful cucumber, but it highly likely does not have those nutrients that it always should have had and were designed to eat. And that is how we become extremely mineral deficient in, in this country. And I I know, for example, one of the big things for me personally in health and is, is a hot topic is just how magnesium deficient um, and zinc deficient are Yes. our population is and those are very very critical to behavior and being calm and not being depressed and in when I look around and I see this frenetic and everyone's upset and everyone's sad and maybe mm -hmm. not everyone but it seems like a lot of people these days mm -hmm. and it just makes me feel that everyone should be forced to take a magnesium and zinc supplement <laughs> <laughs> well, not to mention immune function right we speak about zinc and speak about our immune health, but I wanted to, to shift a little bit our conversation because Bayer will be removing Roundup from consumer shelves in 2023, correct? But there are still, you know, generations of people that are completely oblivious to Roundup's harmful effects. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to say about, so it's removed from the consumer shelves, but we know there's kind of a shell game going on where it will just appear in a different form under a different name. We know that Liberty is another product that's out there now that maybe started out from Bayer. And I think another company, like a Canadian company, mm -hmm. bought that. Um, but I don't know if you could speak about the change that is just this shell game that it was in this form and now it's going to show up in this other form, but that doesn't mean it's gone. Yes. So as part of the, a lot of the lawsuits that Bayer was on the hook for came from mm -hmm. residential users of Roundup. And so they were developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mostly from dermal exposure and the way that Roundup works, it can go right through your skin um, because of the way the formula works and get the life sick and get into your bloodstream and really accelerate uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in certain people. And so because so many of the people that were suing them, just as uh, it was well over a hundred thousand people suing on because they'd been exposed to Roundup and then they had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And Bayer just had massive billions of dollars of settlement that they agreed to just to settle these cases and not have them go to court. Mm -hmm. And as part of their way to protect themselves for, for, from further litigation, they said, okay, well, we're going to take this off the shelves um, for residential use, glyphosate-containing herbicides. Mm -hmm. But we don't think that it causes cancer. We're only doing this so that you can't sue us and blame us for it. Right. And no liability, no. Yeah. Yeah. And so in 2023, they were supposed to, and I don't know, they didn't actually say a month, but I was looking, I'm constantly, when I'm at Home Depot, I'm looking to see what the contents are because Roundup will still be available. It just won't have glyphosate in it. Mm -hmm. And so they're bringing in other things. And I know that 2,4-D, which is half of Agent Orange, actually, it's a component oh. of that, which is highly toxic. Mm -hmm. And Dicamba, which is also extremely toxic and can lead to neurological disorders are on the table as potentially replacing glyphosate. So you're right. Like, you know, they may take glyphosate out, but it's going to be more of the same. People will be buying Roundup still, um, not realizing anything changed probably for most people. Right, right. Well, I think that's something that Zach Bush uh, has often warned of, that the thing that would be coming afterward could be worse than the glyphosate that we see now. I mean, um yeah, they don't be, be. In, in just like doom, kind of like a doom scrolling conversation, but at the same time, you know, we have to, to be vigilant at the same time. You know, how do you see justice prevailing when regulatory agencies like the, that are meant to protect us, the EPA or the FDA that's kind of following the EPA's direction are captured by corporate interests? Um, it's heartbreaking to see just how captured they are. 
I, to such an extent that I'm not sure we need them at all. I think that <laughs> taxpayers shouldn't pay, pay for them. I'm really sad about it. I had two opportunities to go and approach the EPA um, with a group under Moms Across America. Mm -hmm. And we went, we brought, Zach came to both of them, okay. um, and a few other scientists, and we presented just binders of research, literally, we were handing over to them of the damage that this chemical causes. And both times they said it's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And it's not anecdotal. These are peer reviewed, excellent pieces of research, and they're opting to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's so incredibly frustrating. And in terms of the GMOs now, um, the FDA has decided that instead of regulating them and seeing whether GMOs are safe, they instead tell the company, you tell us if it's safe. You do some right. studies. We'll you do advise your own you. studies. Yeah. yeah. Do your own yeah. studies. <laughs> do your own studies. And we'll say, okay, yes or no, but they always say yes, you know. Right. And so one thing that I was concerned about actually with the roundup coming um, off the shelves in Home Depot and other residential or hardware stores is that they put a caveat in that they can only take it out if the EPA says it's okay, their new formulation is. And so they're in cahoots with the EPA. So they, I wouldn't be surprised if they just kept on selling glyphosate, you know, based um, roundup. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is very frustrating because I just have, personally felt at wit's end about the regulators. And I don't, I really don't understand from a moral and ethical standpoint, how they get up in the morning. It's not all of them. There are actually some people that are great there, but right. they're, the leaders are really bought mm -hmm. and they get up and they go and they approve these poisons, knowing that we're all drinking them and eating them. Right. So it's, it's all collusion. Yeah. And, and it's like the, the, the interest, you know, whether it's political interest, academic interest, and it's money, if money weren't involved, this wouldn't be happening. You know, oh, absolutely. It, it wouldn't be happening. And so, I was so heartbroken because there's a really fantastic functional doctor who is the one that discovered what exactly the mechanism was that gluten can help facilitate or like causes or accelerates leaky gut. And mm -hmm. And so I went up to him and I asked him, hey, would you be interested in looking to see if glyphosate can, if it's part of the issue here? And he said, oh, it definitely is. But I work for Harvard and Harvard would never let me study that. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's really depressing. He's like, it is. That's just the way the money works. So, right. you know. Yeah. It's kind of the strange golden handcuffs um, to the extreme. It is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Could you speak about, many people may know, many listeners may be familiar with the Lee Johnson case. He was a school groundskeeper and the first one who brought Monsanto to trial. And he had uh, contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma due to Roundup exposure. And I know in his case, there was uh, evidence of ghostwriting that came up uh, in the evidence. And I'm wondering if you could talk about ghostwriting mm -hmm. and kind of that that compromise. Yeah. Well, when IARC, so the International Agency on Research in Cancer, they are an organization that's Europe-based, so there are global, global contributions to it. And they meet every so often and they look at commonly used chemicals and they assess whether or not they cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And usually these types of assessments are done by regulatory offices and that's why they're corrupted. But this is an academic group that is apparently pretty clean and they are not bought off. And after looking at all the research, they thought, okay, this definitely appears to probably cause cancer mm -hmm. on many different studies. I mean, just a huge, huge group of studies. Mm -hmm. And Monsanto didn't like that. They saw it coming. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as they saw that IARC was going to be looking at it, they realized this is probably going to come back that it causes cancer. So what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. So what they did was they hired an agency to get a few scientists who are toxicologists mm -hmm. to look at these studies and just cherry pick and adjust the data to make it look like it definitely does not cause cancer, mm -hmm. then publish it just under their name. Mm -hmm. So not there by the, these independent scientists, not Monsanto, to make it appear to be third party. Right. And yeah, yeah. This is the, and actually that wasn't the first time that they'd done that. They'd done that earlier on. Um, they really, they really messed with some of the science and what the documents showed uh, that they, that were revealed through this trial is these back and forth emails between the scientists to the mm -hmm. point that you could see that the chief toxicologist was in there editing oh. the research paper 
to show, to change the language and just flat out writing a lot of it and then saying, okay, great, now you can publish it. And mm -hmm. then if you go and you look at the EPA to see what research they depend on to make their evaluation, that paid research from Monsanto that Monsanto wrote right. is there as right. a point of reference. Right. That's and it doesn't just end in academia. You also have Forbes um, famously printed an article, although this happens practically every day, it seems, where some org news organization is paid off to go in and put a great story about Roundup and there's a there's a professor that um, was in as a retired professor actually from Stanford by the time he was at Stanford and he was paid to write a very esteemed article in Forbes about the safety of glyphosate and what a ridiculous situation is that this is mm -hmm. under persecution. Right. And you know what? It's successful. It's very successful PR and a really successful tactic. You can get away with that for a long time until someone decides to sue you, really. Right. Well, I think people want to believe what they want to believe. And it's actually almost in some ways easier to believe that, that it's not toxic, that it's not harmful, you know, because then you don't have to be concerned about so many other things, that's but true. that's not, it's not the truth. And you have to be an astute, uh, astute researcher on our own, you know, because we know that we are being kind of fed um, in our searches and so forth. You really have to be able to dig through alternative sources of media and um, know where to find the truth that you're seeking it's hard it's yeah. really hard to do and it takes time and and most people don't have time to do that you know so. well you know, i wanted to to ask you as we talked about there's been tens of thousands of cases that have been settled and Bayer has paid out a lot of money for those settlements but do you perceive that as a good or detrimental thing because once the cases are settled they essentially are invisible Versus these cases that are high profile and and it really highlights the tox the toxic nature of Roundup and glyphosate. I'm really disappointed that so many are settled. And what Bear is doing now is they actually so the the original legal teams there were three original cases that went to trial and they were the ones that hit headlines and this was 2018 and 2019 yes. and it was so great for the Roundup movement you know for all of us and really a godsend. Mm -hmm. And they were having this great success. Now, those legal teams that were doing that were outstanding. The mm -hmm. ones that, well, being both sides, but particularly those that were representing the plaintiff. Uh -huh. And I mean, just in, in watching them, and particularly Brent Wisner, um, perform, and it felt almost like a performance because it was so beautiful and so articulate and just really brilliant. And I don't see how a jury would ever, like, disagree with him. Right. And... Then Bear very quickly realized that they never want to go up against someone like Brent ever again. Mm -hmm. And so they <laughs> rapidly started settling. Mm -hmm. And Brent was at Brent and now it's Wisner Baum is the name of his law firm and, mm -hmm. and the Miller Group, another law firm. They did not want to be taking on cases that were shaky cases where that person has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but you know, it's, it's not like each case of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is from glyphosate. Right. And so he, they didn't want to take those. They wanted high quality cases. Now those high quality cases were settled um, mm -hmm. out of court and for a decent amount, but there were all these and still are tag on lawyers who don't specialize in glyphosate, just saw this as a potential to make a lot of money. So they're mm -hmm. taking any case that they want. And mm -hmm. so now it's, I think it's four, up to four wins on the bear side okay. and they're making it very public. They're saying, see, it doesn't cause cancer. Right. But the quality of the case was of course, it, you're going to come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's disappointing because in, in actually um, the original legal team had a case ready to go in November. And it was like the day before the bear said, okay, no, never mind. We don't want to do it. And I was disappointed because I wanted to see them toasted again. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> well, hopefully there will be more cases like that. I'm sure there's plenty more out there to mm -hmm. come to, to litigation, but um, you know, even as the roundup litigation continues, Bayer seems to be doubling down on herbicide usage, as we've already kind of discussed. And in 2019, uh, Bayer promised to spend $5.6 billion over the next 10 years on herbicide research. So would you make some comments on that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. And hearing all the things that they proposed. So one of the things they proposed in settling is they said, let's just put a pause on all cases and then we'll appoint an independent group of scientists to, to <laughs> assess right. whether it causes cancer or not. You can trust us. Right, that are on our payroll. Yeah, yeah totally on our payroll. 
Yeah. I mean, ridiculous. And and so anytime you see any of these, it's not just glyphosate. If anytime you see any of these chemical companies or you know pharmaceutical companies that are promising, oh, let's do more research, that's just a delay tactic. That's they know that they're in trouble, and that if they really did the research, then they would it would not look good for them. So yeah, it just. <laughs> when they say that kind of thing, it just cracks me up. And each time then it, now the judge actually, that was, that was handling the vast majority of the federal cases. He mm -hmm. didn't really understand exactly what they were up to in the beginning, but now that it's been so many years, he'll like laugh when that kind of thing is proposed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and then refreshing. Appeal, yeah, right. Yeah. And appeals yeah. as a tactic and how, how, what about appeals as a tactic? Cause you know, they keep wanting to also appeal certain cases and you know, they don't want to pay or, or they want to keep going on with the case. Yeah. And, appeal, appeal. That's been, and, and so they were counting on the Supreme Court coming to their rescue. And so they've been appealing. So it would start locally in, in the San Francisco um, case, the courtrooms, and then it would be appealed all the way up through California Supreme Court, and then up to like Lee Johnson um, or the um, actually some of the subsequent cases were then appeal, Lee Johnson, I actually don't think was, but the mm -hmm. two former were mm -hmm. put up to the Supreme Court. And it was so amusing because the Supreme Court, first of all, sent the case over to the Biden administration to see whether or not they thought that they should hear the case. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. And so then the White House came back and said, we don't think you should see the case. And actually, those of us that were watching, we had no idea because it, all of the politicians are bought off by them. It's not like it's a party situation, yeah. Democrat or, or Republican doesn't matter. And so it was how much was Bear in there able to threaten them to yeah. make the Supreme Court hear it. Collusion at the highest levels is what we say, you know, Completely. but, but the, the, the good thing is to know is that there's many, many millions of people that are working in the direction of, of what we wish to see. And, and that will continue. So people are, even as this is happening, I think we are undaunted and the regenerative mo movement just continues to grow. You know, you can't, can't keep people down forever. So, you know, biotech, but, but on that note, biotech, big chem and big ag are joining forces and they are exploring ways to combine sort of quote unquote organic herbicide applications with robotics and AI. And the claim is that these robotic arms and camera based applications will more precisely pinpoint weeds versus crops or the soil. And, you know, does this seem a bit shocking? Because we know that we can address plantary health by simply practicing smaller scale regenerative farming en masse. Oh my gosh, thank you for saying that because it just seems like these companies are trying to make an economy where there doesn't need to be one. Mm -hmm. They're just trying so frantically to innovate, innovate just to get a cut of some kind of profit when it isn't really that necessary if you went back to regenerative organic mm -hmm. agriculture. Right, yeah. It's kind of the, the biotic versus abiotic conversation. So there is that move. It's like there's two different camps, those that are going back to the land, restoring the land, regenerating the land, and those who are choosing more of this kind of abiotic, uh, divorce from nature route as much as possible, just make it all mechanical. Absolutely. So. And in fact, um, one of the one of the incredible inventions that I saw a uh, blueprint for was <laughs> drone bumblebees. Oh, I which, haven't seen that one. Which is scary because there aren't enough bees to pollinate. So, you know, got to do something. So the drone bumblebee. Okay, so it's kind of like going into, I know that they're also making synthetic microbes. So oh. these are the things that when that starts entering the ecosystem, you know, how, how long does it take to eradicate that out? You know, how through the, the gene, uh, the legacy of genes, how long does it take to change that? Just like with GM salmon. I mean, these things are in our ecosystem now or, or the, the GM mosquitoes. So yeah. there, it's just huge conversations, but in the meantime, we have to just keep going on and keep kind of bucking what's coming forth. Yeah, and do our best. Mm -hmm. So um, Zach Bush often speaks about the fact that exposure, that third generation, the third generation exposed to Roundup or glyphosate, um, it's exponentially more harmed than the first generation exposure. I don't know if you could uh, elaborate more upon that, why that is. 
So I'm so happy too, but I just am worried that this says break time, break time. Oh, okay. We're going to honor the break time because <laughs> we have just seen that. We're going to come back and speak more about generational exposure to Roundup and why the harm is greater for those who are exposed in later generations. Good. So Kelly, we're back. And if you could speak more about generational exposure to Roundup what our glyphosate, why it can be more harmful to subsequent generations versus first generation exposure. Mm -hmm. A really upsetting study came out that showed in that in rats, when you give a rat, like a, a, a female rat roundup at or glyphosate at a dietary level that is comparable to what we might be um, exposed to. And then she has her babies and then those babies have babies deformities start showing up in that second in the grandchild and great grandchild generation, even if only that original mom was given glyphosate. So just that one feeding changed the, particularly the endocrine system and made some DNA modifications, genetic modifications that then aren't showing up for a time. And yeah, I think this is when, when Zach is talking about how we have this roundup generation coming up, we don't know. And I know I, for one, when I was pregnant, I was eating all kinds of things with roundup. I mean, probably more than, than the study showed. And that's just so scary because we already see how ill our children are um, across the board. And so if that's how this generation is and roundup, so right now, we'll start to see it a little bit more because just given that it came into the market in 76, but really starting to eat it in, in the 2000s, we're going to get more of a picture of just how harmful it is. And if we can even do anything about it, or if um, anyone will be willing to attribute the disease that we see to this. Right. And that's just so, so incredibly sad. And I think uh, a, another aspect of glyphosate is that when a pregnant mom is is ingesting it it it's actually a really shocking study that came out so the scientists studied in the second trimester um, the urinary levels of glyphosate in that mom mm -hmm. and when the mom had the babies it was correlated that the higher the level of glyphosate in that mom in that second trimester the farther the distance between the vagina and the anus in the female fetuses which is androgenization Okay. Oh, so that is just a really terrifying conclusion of that, that, you know, it, it won't be funded to study anymore, but we know how much it really, really impacts. Um, it, it can accelerate and even cause miscarriages, having it um, infertility because I, and <laughs> with the infertility piece, it's really incredible because it's been shown that glyphosate does cross the blood testes barrier and causes early sperm death. Mm -hmm. So you have all of these people that are wondering, why can't I get pregnant? And oftentimes it's the sperm quality, but people aren't questioning, well, what is it in the sperm that's doing this? It might be, maybe we're exposed to all the time. And I don't just think it's glyphosate, it's other toxins as well. Right. But I actually sent um, three sperm samples out to a lab to find out what the glyphosate content was of relatively healthy guys. And uh -huh. all three came back with glyphosate in their semen, mm -hmm. all three. And, and that is just very sad because knowing very well with a few of my friends who have struggled with infertility, it's just such a heartbreak. Right. Because not only the quality of the sperm, it's also the counts, correct? Exactly. Right. So the early sperm death is not going to be helpful with that. Mm -hmm. I There was a recent study published in the Journal of American, uh, Amer American Medical Association, and it had found that glyphosate rates were, were up 500%, and then the average levels were up 1200% in people over the last 20 years. Oh. So it's, it's pretty astounding, you know, how much, how prevalent it is, but it does make perfect sense when we speak about the generational exposure and how people used to eat. And when, when were, when was glyphosate introduced? When were um, the Roundup Ready crops introduced? And so it makes sense why these younger generations are, are so much more um, uh, susceptible to, to the harm. And I'm thinking all the time because my daughter, um, I, she lost a baby tooth and I decided to send the baby tooth into the lab and they found glyphosate in oh the tooth. My God. Oh my God. And so that baby tooth formed when she was in utero. 
So I'm like, mm. okay, so is this, is she completely composed of glyphosate on her cellular and bone level? Mm. I mean, it seems that would be probable given what some of the scientists have found also in the bones of the animals that are fed the, the GMO in Roundup drenched food. Do you think that, I, I, I don't know if urine tests are useful. Do you think that urine tests are useful for people who think that they have heavy glyphosate exposure? Is there any value to that? Well, I've kind of wondered because they can be expensive. And so what, what is it that you're going to gain from it? And well, what do you do with the I knowledge think, once you have it, right? And, and for some people, it, and for me, when I first did a glyphosate test on the early days, it was shocking to read it. And I think I was able to internalize it more as like, this is proof that this is in my body and I don't like that. Uh -huh. But I can't imagine someone not finding it in their urine. Right. So, it, so I guess it's like, well, how much is it? I, okay. I had a whole lot more in my urine, even when I'd gone organic than, um, than uh, average European had, for example. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we have the worst worldwide, I would imagine. I don't know though, if that's true, but I- I, I can imagine it so, yeah. Yeah. Apparently Japan also has a, has a large problem with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's often said that to make effective change in society, 25% of the population pop, populace needs to change its consciousness or behavior. And then only then do policies actually begin to reflect this change. Does this feel true to you? Oh my gosh. What a great statement that is. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> It completely, oh my gosh, to get to that 25% would be just phenomenal. That is exactly the goal. Mm -hmm. And I so often wonder, and this is what I work on really day in, day out. And it's like, what is, what is the tipping point going to be? What is it? Is it a large PR campaign? Is it just telling everyone and any, anyone who will listen that this is a problem without sounding hysterical and like a strange person. Cause still mm -hmm. there are plenty of people that can't even imagine this is happening because it just seems a wild far right. thing. <laughs> and then they find contrary evidence if they do their oh, own search. Easily. Yeah. If they do their own search and they'll find any of the top five PR groups that are out there to say how safe it is and probably list me as a crazy person. I, I searched on you first. And then when I searched the next time, all the studies that were coming up were like, oh, it's not harmful. It's not harmful at all. And oh. then I could I really dig to get back to your website. I know how yeah. it works. It's, uh, yeah. And actually, yeah. I just I just hired a, a web firm to try and like work on my SEO so I can start competing right. with them. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Got to work on that optimization for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I, I really feel strongly, and if this is, sad that this is the case, but at least in my case, I was unwilling to make any dietary change really until I was on my knees in chronic disease and had no other choice. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Isn't that a shame? And I was so, I loved my, Ore I, I loved Oreos. I love not thinking about it. I was feeling good, you know, and that's why I landed where I landed. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. But I do think, as I say, the demand for functional integrative medicine right now is through the roof. Like you can't even get an appointment to most of these doctors because Absolutely people are looking that. for answers. And right. I was just recently actually in, in a doctor's office and on one of their, their lists of things that they do test for is glyphosate. And I thought, well, that is a big step because six years ago when I was starting, it, it wasn't the case. Like they weren't looking for that. And well yeah, and there's a perfect storm with the pandemic too, because a lot more people suffered. I mean, they I think it was really evident that many, many people were ill and that their immune systems were compromised and so much of their health was compromised. And I think that just showed, you know, I was reading about the oxidative stress components, the of course, inflammation related with glyphosate. And then you pair that with the pandemic, you know, um, yeah. We were really well situated as a country to have a horrible, horrible experience with COVID just because our immune systems were so shot. And that, you know, that's the other thing with glyphosate is that it, it specifically works on our microbiome in almost like an antibiotic would. And it, mm -hmm. it doesn't impact our bad gut bacteria, but it kills off our good gut bacteria proven in science. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the biologist who did it, so no fighting about it. Right. And, <laughs> And that significantly lowers so, I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, the microbiome controls so much of who we are. Mm -hmm. We're really just a shell with just lots of bacteria in there dictating it. And so when you have something going in there and killing off that good gut bacteria, our immune system's shot, our moods are off, just, mm -hmm. just the, so many 
in implications on that. But to your point too, I I do I have seen a big shift because I was like a safe girl well before COVID started. But I think that COVID did indeed open eyes because mm-hmm. it is no longer a far fetched idea that this could happen. Right. Uh, that we have this weed killer on our food and that maybe it has some health impact. So that's just refreshing when when trying to just inform the public that maybe there's a little bit more of an opening. I think people have have decided to take more responsibility knowing where their food comes from. And a lot more people have become invested in growing their own foods or getting back to the lands. I mean, it's, it's definitely a trend for sure. Oh yeah. It's so fun. And I, I converted my front lawn to be growing my, my, it's the only space I had. So it's like, well, uh here it's going to be, you know, neighbors like it or not. Uh, (laughs) They'll become good for food when there's a food supply shortage. (laughs) (laughs) No, totally. Then they'll, then they'll be happy. You're right. They'll be begging <laughs> to be a friend. No, um, you know, it's easy to want to place blame or become angry regarding the state of farming and planetary health due to glyphosate and, and all the other um, uh, evidence of collusion and corruption and greed and, and power mongering. But, but action is more powerful than anger. And at this juncture, what are actionable things listeners can do to empower the change we want to see? Absolutely. So. My feeling is that most definitely the strongest thing you can do is buy things that are organic or they're regeneratively organic or go to your farmer's market and talk to your farmers and find out what they're doing. And even if there isn't a big organic sign on their on their stand, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are spraying pesticides because sometimes it's just expensive or a hassle to get that certification. So they just don't. And if you go there and you're supporting these small farmers, you start to reverse this massive corporate monocropping system. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these farmers will go out of business because they just don't have a big enough market Mm -hmm. to the point that even if you go to Whole Foods and you buy something that's organic, Driscoll's strawberries, for example, they're grown on tarps in in a very non-regenerative way, like very monocropped soil. (laughs) And so, but that they are the ones that get the grocery space in Whole Foods or wherever it is. And I've seen them at Safeway too. Because they're so large. They're so large and they can, and they can provide regularly, you know, the strawberries at a good price, Right. but they're not healing the soil and they're not making it extra nutritious or anything like that. So going in and supporting those farmers so that they can have a business is really the most impactful thing you can do. Second, I would not dismiss how impactful it can be to write the companies that you are interested in seeing be glyphosate free and mm-hmm. be doing things more cleanly. Mm-hmm. I know that um, the glyphosate free res- glyphosate residue free certification, um, the demand for that process has skyrocketed recently. I and haven't heard of that. That's it. amazing. Isn't That's that amazing? amazing. Yeah. And so on a few different bags of things recently, I saw some rolls and um, they weren't organic, but I looked on the back, I saw that and I was just over the moon. And not only that, they were gluten-free, which for me, I mean, that combo is heaven. Yeah. And, and and so looking for that and writing to the companies, and that sounds like, I don't know, it's kind of annoying. You just might feel like you might send it off and never hear anything. And you might not, but they are listening just given the fact that we know that the mills are responding to this. Mm-hmm. So going back to that pre-harvest spraying, the mills know that the company, like, um, you know, Kellogg's doesn't want to have this grain have glyphosate on it. And why is that? Because lots of people were complaining about it. Consumers and, uh, are beginning to know, and they are speaking up and they're, and, and they're voting with their dollars. Simply. Yes. The premium you can get, if you get in there and you have a great organic product or a glyphosate free product is significant. It's super significant. The only reason why these conventional farmers with the the corn and soy and and chemicals can even make do is because there are huge government subsidies to keep them afloat. Mm -hmm. Um, We had another regenerative farmer on the show um, and Molly Anglehart, and she was talking about cheap food is the devil. It's like when you're buying the cheap food, you're supporting glyphosate, you're supporting GMOs, you're supporting all of that because that's where the cheap food, if you trace back, it's from that source. Absolutely. Because, and and then, and why is it cheap? Because the government paid for it one way or the other, like, you know, and so they don't have to even sell at market prices. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we have time, I would love to talk about the impossible burger. Cause when, when you said that, I do. I would... oh my gosh, yes, please <laughs> talk about the impossible burger that we never want to eat. <laughs> it, it's my recent, just so anger, because when you were, you were saying 
what that other guest said with this cheap food. Mm -hmm. So not that impossible is cheap, by the way, it actually isn't, mm -hmm. but it, this one product represents absolutely everything that's wrong with agriculture in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's so upsetting. Now they have this great relationship with um, Burger King. So they're really pushing it. I saw an ad recently. So their numbers of sales have actually gone up, but their sales in the grocery stores are not going crazy at all. Um, because so many people feel so sick after they have it, frankly, like it not just down the line chronically ill, like immediately having to go to the bathroom. So they um, have, so these impossible burgers were designed to um, replace obviously meat. And they came out with this splashy campaign and, and big investors and Bill Gates backed it. And they came in and they said, this is fantastic. This is going to absolutely save the planet and health because meat is really bad. It's bad for the environment. And yeah, and it's bad for people to eat. So this is fantastic. So they did this splashy, very expensive, impossible campaign. You probably could recognize that teal package from afar in the grocery store. <laughs> and, and and but however, it, what what is in that? It's not like it's your old fashioned veggie burger that like I had when I was young, where it's like mushrooms and beans all smashed together. <laughs> yeah. it, it's 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 GMO soy that's in there. And additional genetically modified components that are so unbelievably fresh, not readily approved by the FDA until they were strong armed to approve it. And they create this, this dye that looks like meat blood and gives it that meat taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is a toxic bomb. It has so much glyphosate in it. And <laughs> just outrageous levels. That's why it's impossible. You're going to have impossible health after that. It's absolutely impossible. impossible to rectify your health. Yeah. Okay. And so I could go crazy because on their website, I was perusing it and they go into how great this is and, you know, using agriculture instead. Meanwhile, the agriculture that's getting you there is the same agriculture. That's what we've been talking about. The GMO soy, the spray, it's Roundup Ready and not just Roundup Ready, but other things by Canva and other chemical ready. And that is supposedly the, the future. I, I'm not, I don't understand how that argument can continually be made that actually it's good for the environment when it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, so I think keep the problem is all about education, right, Kelly? And that's what your glyphosate facts is about is the more people educate themselves and really have to, they have to trace the source of their foods and then they start to know more, you know, it's, that's imperative. Absolutely. Yeah. And they can, and, and I have, and you, you're aware and People shouldn't feel overwhelmed with this because there are things that you can do that we talked about and you can control your health and you can control your exposure. So and don't feel, don't better, feel hopeless. You taste better. You're healing the planet. There, everything is a vote for the right direction. You know, when you, when you choose foods that are, are you know, not non-toxic and uh, are, you know, grown regeneratively, you know, Kelly, could you share with us about your website and how listeners can be uh, connected with you and stay abreast of whatever it is that you are doing? Yes, absolutely. So my website is glyphosatefacts.com and you can just get some bare bones information that hopefully is clear to you or if you want to make a presentation off of what is glyphosate if you're a student or to your community, you should be able to access the information there. And if you um, want to come and follow me on Instagram, that's where I'm most active. And uh, you can hear my various reels of what's irritating me that day about glyphosate. <laughs> and so that's at, that's at glyphosategirl.com and you can DM me and I'm, I'm pretty responsive. So thank you. And tell about um, your children's defense fund, how you are also. Oh yeah. The children's health. Yeah. And children's health defense on every third Wednesday, I'm going to be um, co-hosting their um, good morning CHD show. So that, and that's a lot of fun we'll be talking glyphosate GMOs and having some really interesting guests on there that are doing really cool things in agriculture. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, Kelly. It was such an important conversation because really there's not a person on the planet that isn't affected by glyphosate. Like I think we would probably find that in every single human being on this planet. Completely. Absolutely. So, so it's, it's, it's up to all of us also to change, change um, and eliminate glyphosate from, from the ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah.